So in our third session, having looked at the curriculum and looked at the content of the technologies learning area, we're now going to look at how to teach it. This we call pedagogy. Now, in this week's session, we're going to look at how to use what's called activity-based learning, a specific element of this called the Elemental Learning Design Model, project-based learning, play-based learning, and the way we can integrate various approaches and aspects of the curriculum to make teaching and learning more effective. So let's get into things. What is pedagogy? Essentially, it's all the theories and practices around how we teach. Now, there are different ways of teaching. None of them are better than others, and they all contribute to what I call your toolbox of teaching techniques. Experienced, effective teachers have a wide range of approaches to teaching, and you use them in different circumstances, depending upon what you're teaching, who you're teaching, um, the particular time of year. There's a whole range of different uh, factors that will be involved in your decisions as a professional teacher around how to go about your teaching. And generally, these judgments are left to you as a professional. You need to, over time, develop your different approaches to teaching. Now, some of them will suit your personality and style better than others, and that's fine. Um, but the wider range of approaches that you have skill in, the better you're going to be as a teacher. Okay, so pedagogy refers to the approaches that you take. And sometimes they are, um, you need to fit in with others sometimes. You can't always do exactly what you want. Sometimes your school will have a very a particular pedagogical approach that they're um, trying to adopt across the board. Sometimes there'll be a group of teachers. Sometimes a subject area will lend itself towards a particular pedagogical approach. So while you do have the ultimate freedom, there are some instances when you do need to fit in with what a bigger picture is other than just your own individual classroom. So in the technologies learning area, there's, well, the curriculum doesn't specify pedagogy. Um, technologies in particular does tend to lend itself towards a particular approach. And this approach is what we call constructionism, um, where we construct knowledge. And we're going to explore this, but it's very much supported by a project-based um, style of teaching and learning. That doesn't mean to say, though, that we can't use other styles. And the other main approach that we're going to be talking about, and we're going to use an umbrella term, um, activity-based learning, that it encompasses what's called direct instruction, which is probably what you're more familiar with as the um, stereotypical style of teaching, um, where, a, where a teacher takes control and directs how students learn. But there are other approaches, and we're going to explore some of those. Okay, so as I said, the main approaches will be around a combination of project-based learning and activity-based learning. Of course, they are complementary, even though they are quite... Um, diametrically opposed in terms of a spectrum of pedagogical theory, taking just one extreme of pedagogy in terms of, say, a purely uh, constructionist approach would have some problems. Of course, it does some things really well, but other things not as well. Just as direct instruction or activity-based learning does some things very well, but other things not so well. So being... Um, Using a combination of the two provides um, support for each of, each of their weaknesses. And it's also important to have variety for your students. Always being taught the same way and the same type of, of approach does get wearing, both for teachers and for the students. So you want to build out a variety. Now, these two approaches, and we're going to cover a few more as well, are only a small subset of many different ways of going about teaching and learning, different pedagogies. And over time, you'll become a more experienced teacher and you'll incorporate more of these approaches in your teaching and learning. Okay, so there's three main theories of learning 
that we generally utilize in education. There are others, but these are the three main ones. There's behaviorism, which is essentially around trying to have students do things in a particular way, learn things as we want them to learn, um, behave as we want them to learn, uh, want them to behave, these sorts of approaches. And it's very good at achieving that. We have constructivism, which is the theory of learning about how we construct new knowledge based upon previous knowledge. And sometimes we have to deconstruct misconceptions in order for new knowledge and new understanding to be accepted. And then we have a relatively new area called cognitivism. And this is based upon our growing understanding of how the brain works and how we have various processes that can support and enhance learning through better understanding uh, how our brain functions, particularly with the construction of neurons and memory formation and, and things of this nature. Now, in the extension notes, there are some additional readings there that if you want to explore some of these learning theories, you can go into them. But we're not going to delve into great depth in terms of learning theory in this course. You will do that in some of your other courses. OK, but in technologies education, there are a range of learning theories that have um, significant place. We just talked about um, in brief cognitivism, constructivism and instructivism. And within that, oh, and sorry, in behaviorism, instructivism is another approach as well. Um, essentially, the two main overarching or the main overarching approach is a combination of what's called transformative learning and constructionism. Um, transformative learning came from adult education, where we started getting a better understanding how we construct knowledge. But in K-12 education, we tend to call it constructionism, where it's around students actively doing things that assist them in constructing new knowledge. So they may be doing a, an activity where they build something or working through problem sheets and, and doing things that way. But there's a process where they construct knowledge. And it's quite uh, linked to the new growing understanding of cognitivism as we understand better how memory formation occurs. Then we have various instructivist approaches, um, direct instruction, mastery learning, evidence-based teaching. These fell out of favor in the 80s and 90s and so forth, um, but have come back quite strongly. And many schools are taking a very much a um, instructivist approach to teaching and learning. Of course, it does have some very strong successes in certain circumstances, particularly around preparing students to do well on external assessment items. Um, but it does have also weaknesses. And in the area of what's called progressive education, um, we developed a whole range of approaches called inquiry learning, pro problem based learning, project based learning, approaches that tend to allow students to be more actively involved in the teaching and learning processes. OK, but let's have a look at direct instruction. So essentially, the idea of direct instruction is that a lot of it is quite repetitive, um, where you're reviewing previously taught content and students are mastering new material. And you only ever introduce a small amount of new material at a time, and then you um, repeat and revise a lot of content so that students master it. It's not taught just once off, but they're practiced and practiced and practiced at it until they achieve success. It is often streamed where students are placed in ability groups and students are then work more efficiently under this theory, um, supporting one another where they are at the same level, um, whereby more attention can be given to those students that are not or having difficulty mastering work, while others go on and do either new work or continue with their revisions. And there's also an emphasis on pacing um, in terms of either slowing down or speeding up different groups so that they achieve mastery. They actually learn the material before progressing to the next set of material to be learned. OK, now there's a little video clip that I encourage you to have a look at called How to Do Direct Instruction. Um, and you can do that um, either now or after 
watching this set of um, this video. Okay, so we have activity-based learning, but we also have inquiry-based learning, which is another approach to teaching. But looking more at activity-based learning, we're going to look at a particular model called the Elemental Learning Design. Um, it's an approach used by Education Queensland, and it takes um, teachers through various aspects of activity-based learning um, that makes it a little bit less direct instruction um, and a little bit more effective. Okay, so the first thing is in a lesson to start off with what's called a learning hook. Now, this interests students, that it gains their attention, and it starts them wanting to think about what they're going to be learning and become excited about it. And often it involves a little game or video clip or even just an image, but it's just something to get them interested in what's going to be coming up. So if you were looking at, say, teaching algorithms, you might um, talk about boiling an egg and how we go through various steps. So it's not necessarily teaching them about the algorithms at this point, it's just giving a little example or a little um, something that just interests them. And it's very often very quick and simple, but it gains their attention. Then we have what's called learning input. So some bit of new knowledge, something new that they're going to be learning. Um, and generally this is done by you modeling it as a teacher. You might show them how to do something, um, might show them how to draw a flowchart or uh, program a robot or do have a robot do something. Uh, that you demonstrate something and they can see you doing that. Sometimes you can use video clips or other um, tools to model it, but very often it's the teacher modeling the um, learning that the students are going to be doing. Then you have um, what we often introduce is what's called deliberate mistakes. So we show students the process, then we might show it again, but we leave out something. And we tell the students beforehand often, and we have them identify what the bit is that was the mistake. Um, so it helps them process and understand the what's being presented and being modeled and get a greater understanding of that. Then we contextualize this new learning within what the students have been learning previously and are going to learn in the future. And we call this a learning map. So generally, generally you'll have some sort of big picture framework that students are aware of that they can see where their new learning is going to be placed within. Now, this can often be the curriculum descriptions in terms of how the curriculum is framed, but that may be a little bit complex for, for young students. But even for our very younger students, they should be able to see what, what point is this new learning? How does it fit within the wider framework of learning that they're doing? And this can often be just done with little what's called learning map or progress charts that allow students to see that, okay, we're learning this. This is going to help me in understanding this or we're making progress along our learning pathway by doing this. It doesn't need to be really complex. Of course, very young children don't have a great understanding in terms of metacognition and how things fit within the curriculum framework and all this. That's the job of teachers to have that expertise. Um, but it still is important for some students. Some don't mind at all, and they're quite happy to just learn things without any context. But for some students, they really need that contextual framework. They need to see how it fits in with their other learning in order for it to make sense and for them to enjoy and engage with what they're learning. Okay, so these set out then the learning outcomes. This is what students are going to learn. Now, this doesn't have to be just done by you. Often it is, particularly for the younger children, but you can allow students to have some um, agency and involvement in deciding what they're going to learn within the framework of the curriculum, but there's often a lot of freedom in there. Teachers have that freedom. You've got the ability to incorporate various ideas in terms of what's going to be learned. You can also give some of that freedom to your students. 
Now, it needs to be done in a measured way and students need to develop the maturity and capacity to be able to actively um, co-construct. But they're going to have much greater involvement and ownership of what is being learned if they have been afforded the ability to have some say in what they're learning. Students are not just um, entities that we do things to. They are human beings. They do have rights. They do have interests and capacities. And often we forget that as teachers. And it becomes the curriculum is important and what we want to teach is important, but not necessarily what the students want to learn. But how you frame your learning environment, how your students see learning within your classroom, will be very much determined about how much agency they have over the decisions being made. Now, as a beginning teacher, that can be scary. Of course, you're giving agency to students when you don't really have full control and understanding of the whole process yourself. But as you gain in, in confidence and in experience in how to do things, try giving agency to your students. Try allowing them to be involved. Um, and you can address many different issues in terms of behavior and learning processes um, if students feel that they have a, a say in this process called schooling. Okay, so many of these learning outcomes can then be related to the thinking skills. We're going to be exploring thinking skills in more detail, but they also relate strongly to the general capabilities. There's lots of additional things we want students to learn beyond just what's in those learning descriptions in the curriculum for the various subjects. So allowing students to have a say about those um, other elements, which are semi-optional, um, they're not specified explicitly in terms of the um, content descriptions. They're not generally assessed. So give students a say about those. Um, can we involve something to do with Aboriginality and um, First Nations people in exploring what we're learning about? Can we look at some issues around Asia? Can we do some things about learning about more ICTs or learning more about literacy? Um, there's lots of different um, activities and things that we can incorporate into what students are learning that students can have say, some engagement with. And of course, you should be thinking about those if you're not giving it to the students to incorporate, you should be incorporating those. Okay, so this also allows us then to go cross-curricular. How can we integrate what they're learning with other learning areas? Does it relate to mathematics or English or geography or history? How can we incorporate some of those aspects? And also cross age groups, um, particularly in small schools, you may have the opportunity to teach multiple age groups at once. So then it becomes really important to be able to have activities and learning um, uh, processes that cater for students at different ages and different um, stages in the curriculum. OK, so it's all about discussing and negotiating and allowing students to have a say in that helps them much better understand those thinking skills and cross-curriculum priorities and mindsets and skill sets and all the rest, rather than just doing what the teacher says. And with that ownership, we also have the opportunity to differentiate. This means that we can have students doing different things, ideally based upon their interests, but it may be because of their ability levels. We put all the students that are struggling in one group together and help them with various activities. Those students that are racing ahead, we let them do different things. We've got some students that are really interested in farming, letting them do activities around that context. Other students that are interested in, say, surfing, they do it around different contexts and different aspects. So when students get a say and when you allow some different things to be occurring, then you can achieve differentiation. OK, and so much of this can also, again, be um, facilitated with uh, charts and diagrams and students having an ability to contribute to different ideas and different approaches. OK, then we have learning construction. Once you've decided what we're going to learn and you've modeled some examples of it and so forth, now we actually have to um, consolidate that learning. 
And generally, any new things that they're learning, students should have an opportunity to actively construct with that, to do something with it. That will then reinforce the learning. So it's not just purely um, theory. They actually should do something with it. And that's how most of our learning activities are framed. They learn about something, some, some, sort of, some sort of idea or process, and then they do it, they practice it, and they master it. Now, as much as possible, students should be allowed opportunities to experiment and play and push the boundaries and fail and retry and be creative with how they're doing this. Different contexts and different things can um, lend themselves towards that more than others. But particularly in technologies, letting students fail and retry is an essential aspect of creativity. And it's something we're really bad at in education, where we don't let students fail. But failure is an essential part of the creative process um, and of any design process. Um, and we're going to talk about how to um, facilitate that a little bit later. So one good example of learning construction is the computer game Minecraft. If you haven't played that or seen that, it's being used a lot in um, schools in all learning areas, um, but especially in design and technology, um, and to a certain extent, digital technologies as well, that it's a simulated environment which is based around the premise of students constructing things and learning through the process of construction. Um, but in whatever process students are constructing their new knowledge, you should allow them opportunities to share their new learning, share what they've found with their friends. Um, of course, as they're exploring, they're going to identify new ways of doing things and new new aspects and properties. So if, it's, if they're learning a particular piece of software, they may learn new ways of doing things or new functions within that software and allow them to share that. Don't just be the only source of information for your students. Allow them to find out new things on their own and to share that with their friends. And the game Minecraft is a great example of that. It comes with no instruction manual although they have been created by players since, that it was designed intentionally not to need an instruction manual. It's incredibly complex and detailed, and um, there's lots of things you have to learn that are really complex through play. But the idea is that you find out it, about it through that, that process. And you might then tell your friends about how you can put these things together and they'll create this thing. Um, and that's a really engaging part of that learning um, construction process. Okay, so for example, we might have activity as you did um, around creating paper planes and making a flow chart on how to make the super paper plane that's going to fly the furthest. But it's not then just about using that for students to make their own paper plane, having it so that they give that then to other students to follow the instructions, follow the algorithm and flow chart to make that paper plane design while they make someone else's um, design. So they have to then think through giving clear instructions and it takes the algorithmic process to a whole new level when it becomes for someone else's purpose rather than just a documentation of our own thinking processes. Okay, then after they've constructed this new knowledge, they then need to demonstrate it. Um, and students should always be given an opportunity to showcase what they what they can do, what they can do with this new capacity that they've developed. Um, sometimes that can be in front of the whole class, sometimes just to their friends or their peers. Um, and you are often just moving around, looking at how they're going and seeing what they're doing. And you're gathering data on how successful they're being. Now, you might be going around taking photos or video clips or just taking notes. And you'll use that then to record who has been successful at different um, elements, and also then what you're going to do in your next lesson in terms of addressing those areas of deficiency where students haven't been able to do things to the level of mastery that you expect. Now, sometimes students could use their critical friends and um, demonstrate it to them. And that's a great way of saving time and having that demonstration process be effective. Um, they should also be using the terminology that's involved in the curriculum. 
course, learning about these new terms is learning in itself, uh, learning what algorithm means, what flowchart means, using it in the right context in the right way. So the demonstration stage is another good opportunity to, for them to demonstrate their vocabulary. Okay, and so essentially you're just circulating and checking on their progress and looking at how to adapt your next lesson to address any issues. Now the final stage is what's called learning reflection. Now this is where we give the opportunities to reflect on what they're learning. So they should be able to articulate what they have learned, think about when they go home, how they're going to tell their parents about what they've learned today in technologies. Um, but also how it's affected themselves. What can they do now that they couldn't do before? Have they developed or improved upon any of their thinking skills? Um, have they learned to use a new tool? These are things that they can reflect upon in terms of their learning. Um, now, this becomes particularly important as we look at the, the rate of learning that students need to engage with. And they need to be able to reconceptualize new ideas quite quickly and think elastically. So developing this capacity to reflect on their learning, self-reflect, is a really important aspect of being able to cope with the 21st century and the rapid pace of change that we know is going to be occurring and is occurring now. Now, one technique is commonly used is the PMI charts, plus, minus, and interesting. So what has been a positive? What has been a negative? Maybe something that they can't yet do. In a positive, what they can do. And interesting might be something that they that they just found interesting about what they learned today. Some It might relate to another context, but it wasn't necessarily related to their learning goals, or what they hope to achieve in terms of the outcomes, but they still found it interesting. It was still something to be noted. Okay, so that's the elemental learning design process. Now, there are many other direct instructional um, models and activity-based learning frameworks, but they all have relatively similar um, aspects. Some of them emphasize others more than um, in different ways, but they shouldn't be seen as simple algorithms where you just go through and do all of these steps and that's your lesson. Um, you can mix them up. Sometimes you want to do, um, you might do several construction and learning new things, um, inputs and construction activities um, without having to go through the whole process again. Um, sometimes you might put another hook in halfway through just to re-energize and re-engage them with something. So don't think of it as a strict formula that has to be followed in its entirety. It's a framework to help you as a teacher think about creatively different ways of teaching. Oops. Okay. And as you develop your pedagogical skills and your knowledge of learners, you'll come to adapt things and it will add to the various ingredients you have to make learning more effective for your students, just as one pedagogical tool. Okay, so in terms of activity-based learning, we're now going to look more at inquiry-based learning or project-based learning. Now, there are a range of different approaches to inquiry-based learning. Some of them are very teacher-centered still, where you direct students to go through and follow a series of steps. Say it's around baking a cake, where you tell them exactly what the ingredients are, you tell them how to measure it, you tell them how to, to turn the oven on to a certain amount, um, and to put these decorations on it, and how to cut it and serve it, and so forth. And there's very little creativity or student agency in any of the steps. Uh, if you take out any agency, it's hard to make it or justify it as a design activity then, but still it, it, can, it can sometimes happen. And often it's to learn processes and um, tools and particularly around safety. If you want students to learn how to use a saw, then you wanna have a pretty strict control over um, exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it until they've mastered it. And then you might allow them a bit more freedom and creativity. But there are certain things and certain times when you do want to be very teacher-centered. There are other times when you might be entirely student-centered. Students come up with their own problem to solve. Think about what tools they want to use, how they're going to use them, how they're going to construct the project. Um, and it might be entirely uh, in their own agency. Now, to achieve that, students need to have learned how to do projects, how to 
manage them and effectively come to decisions around a whole lot of things. And you would never just throw students straight into doing uh, completely student-centered work. Has been tried. Um, some of the discovery learning, uh, discovery school environments, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, tried purely um, discovery learning uh, and it didn't work out too well. No. Students do benefit from some structure and particularly about learning how to do things before having to explore how to do them on, entirely on their own. But that said, there is a massive amount of gains that can be achieved when students do have the skills and capacities to be student-centered, to make their own decisions about what projects to do, how it's going to be assessed, what the learning goals are going to be. Essentially, a lot of the things that you as a teacher are learning, but the students have to be taught how to do them, just as you're learning how to do them. Um, but when it's achieved, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning can be very, very effective, particularly achieving higher order thinking skills. Now, these are the really high order creative, um, anal analyzing, um, evaluating, uh, complex thinking skills. Whereas direct instruction, um, activity-based learning is much more effective at developing students' lower order thinking skills, um, understanding new knowledge, understanding processes and procedures, how to do things, how to use tools, how to work at a relatively low level cognitively, but it's more effective to learn those things using activity-based learning than it is to use project-based learning. So that's where the two approaches to pedagogy can complement one another. If we have some activity-based learning and some project-based learning, the activity-based learning can consolidate their skills and processes that they need within project-based learning, but the project-based learning then allows them to go further and develop those higher order thinking skills being creative, being inquiring, coming up with new ideas, um, evaluating things on their own, uh, analyzing things. These are the aspects that we see beneficial from inquiry-based learning or project-based learning. Very much built around the constructionism approach to learning where we construct new knowledge based upon prior knowledge, whereas instructivism and direct instruction and um, activity-based learning works from a model of pre-existing knowledge that is imparted to students. It's passed on from previous generations to a new generation through the agency of a teacher and direct instruction. Very different model of understanding of knowledge. Um, whereas the knowledge is pre-existing and it is imparted and given to students. Whereas in constructionism, students create knowledge. They build upon their previous knowledge and they can construct new knowledge based upon that. And it's not a pre-existing body of knowledge that they're receiving. Um, it's an active process of construction. And different students may construct knowledge in slightly different ways and come to different understandings about things. Um, but that's getting a little bit heavy on theory. So within inquiry-based learning, we look at project-based learning, problem-based learning. Another term for it is design-based learning. Um, and we also incorporate what's called play-based learning. And we're going to talk about that separately in a little bit, a little bit at the end. So there's a video clip from a school here on the Gold Coast called King's um, that explores how project-based learning is being employed within their primary school and the success that they're achieving. And so I encourage you to have a look at that. So you can either pause now and have a look at it or look at it after this video. Okay, so within project-based learning, is essentially two styles, extrinsic project-based learning and intrinsic project-based learning. Oops. So extrinsic project-based learning is where the motivation is external. So generally the teacher provides the motivation. You do this because it's in the curriculum um, or I'm telling you to learn it. Uh, not normally that direct, but essentially the teacher is making the decisions about what is to be learned and the student is learning it to please the teacher or to get a good mark or to not get in trouble, uh, various external reasons. And generally there is a predetermined solution that you know as a teacher and you want students to replicate. Now it may be a body of knowledge, it might be a way of doing things, it might be a, how they're going to do the project. It might be around making a pizza. 
and you want them to come up with the pizza that you envisage and you're going to provide them with um, the, the tools and techniques to achieve that. As opposed to intrinsic based project based intrinsic project based learning, where the motivation is generally around what the students interests are and they choose. So it may be what do they want to create as a food item or what sort of pizza do they want to make? If they want to make a marshmallow and cauliflower pizza, that's fine. <laughs> that, of course, would be expected to evaluate it in terms of taste and effectiveness and all the rest, but this allows them to come up with different solutions and to be creative. But it also allows them to sometimes come up with different problems, allow students to choose the problem that they're going to solve. So it may be around feeding the family of four uh, for dinner. They've got certain ingredients. So one child may decide to make it as a pizza. Another one might decide to turn it into um, a cake or a stir fry. Um, so allowing students to come up with different problems to be solved. Well, that's still actually really different solutions, but it may be also what the problem is. So it may be the problem isn't what to feed um, everyone for dinner. The problem may be we don't have enough money to go out and go to McDonald's. Um, so students may reconceptualize the problem around making money. So maybe they make the pizza to sell to get enough money to go to McDonald's, which may be their solution um, to that particular problem. So reconceptualizing the problem itself can be a really effective part of technologies learning. Okay, so in project-based learning, essentially in the very early years, students plan with a lot of support by their teacher, um, but they still do some planning. It's not just following your instructions. Um, we want students to be involved in the designing. Now, sometimes it can be very trivial. It might be choosing colors, but ideally they should be able to make some decisions and allowed to fail, allowed to make bad decisions and to see the consequences of that. Now, within reason, of course, we have to maintain safety and all the rest, and we have to look at what they're going to learn, and we don't want them to go down paths too far in terms of failure. But allowing students to fail can result in really great learning. If students are only ever doing things that they can already do, no learning is actually achieved. Um, so in years three to six, students should be given increasing responsibility also around the roles that they take within a project. Some will be leaders, some will be the planners, some will be the builders. Um, and that collaboration and teamwork is an important aspect of project-based learning, uh, where we can have students take on different roles. Now, it does make it more challenging to assess, because not everyone is doing exactly the same thing. So you have to think about what you're assessing and how you're going to assess it in different ways. Um, but it is certainly possible. So the shift is generally from teacher to student in terms of project management. And this changes the role of the teacher in the classroom from being the instructor to being the facilitator, moving around and helping each project team or each student with what they're doing, rather than just instructing the class on various aspects. And you can also incorporate how ICT can be used to help manage those processes, to keep track of a timeline so students don't run out of time in doing their project, keep track of resources and manage those processes, to communicate with their um, teammates. Uh, okay, so in the readings, uh, I've given you two project-based learning examples, quite complex ones, that also incorporate the thinking skills. We're not quite up to that yet in the course, but uh, we're going to refer back to these documents a little bit later. But they take you through one is doing a project with very young children around using B-Bots. And the other is for, I think, students in grades five to six, um, looking at coming up with a new sporting, uh, a new approach to uh, a sport. In this, in this case, the game Quidditch. So have a look at those. And that'll help you gain a little bit more understanding about what project-based learning can achieve, taken to its extreme. Now. In order to do those sorts of projects, you would have to teach your students how to do projects. You would have to do a lot of simple projects 
building up to being able to have them do projects at that level. But it certainly is possible. And there are classes that have certainly done those, and these were based upon um, classroom activities that teachers were using. OK, so take a little bit of a break, have a look at those examples, and then we'll progress through and explore some other aspects of pedagogy. OK, so welcome back. And just to finish off project-based learning, there is a particular version of project-based learning called challenge-based learning. Now, this was developed in conjunction with the Apple company, um, and it expands project-based learning to look at the problems that the students are going to try to solve in more detail. And it establishes what called big ideas. So trying to solve um, world hunger or gender disparity, some sort of big picture ideas that um, students are going to try to contextualize those around. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't do that with very young children. Um, world hunger contextualized may be, what are we going to have for morning tea so that we're not hungry? Um, or we leave enough, have what we're going to eat at morning tea so we've still got enough food to eat at lunch so we're not hungry in the afternoon. Taking the idea of world hunger, but contextualizing it for young children. And there's a little guidebook in the extension material if you want to explore challenge-based learning in more detail. That's a really good example of how project-based learning can be applied in various ways. OK, so some other aspects. Collaboration is an important part of the curriculum and students learning how to collaborate. Now, teamwork assignments are often met with horror at a tertiary level. Of course, the fear is always that um, someone's not going to pull their weight and you're going to be left doing all the work. In schools, though, we do teamwork and collaboration a lot. Of course, we have much more control and students can't just um, slack off. Of course, we're there to monitor what's happening and, and so forth, as much as they can in tertiary environments. Um, but collaboration is also a 21st century skill. It's one of the key employability skills that have been identified that is needed for our society and in different employment to work. You need to be able to collaborate with others and students need to be able to learn how to do that. We can't just say, do this project and work on it in a team. You have to teach them how to work in teams, how to be leaders and how to be followers. It's called followership. So students need to learn how to do these things. They need to be given opportunities to practice their leadership and to practice their followership Sometimes natural leaders want to take control, even though they're not given that role, and it can be difficult for them to be followers. Likewise, some students that don't have the confidence to be leaders need to be given the skills and the, um, opportunities to explore that leadership role. Now, in F2, generally students focus on their own roles within teams. Um, they may be given a role, it might be to record what the team is doing. It might be to um, do the diagram. Um, they'll can often be given roles. In years three to eight, students will be given various responsibilities with specific roles. Um, and they need to then work out how to perform that role um, with increasing levels of responsibility around collaboration and teamwork. OK, so through all of this, students should develop a broader range of skills a variety of viewpoints, knowing that not everyone wants to solve a problem in the same way. And this can be challenging, uh, particularly young kids. They see a solution in their head and say, OK, well, we're going to do this. But other students may see other solutions and having them understand that those different viewpoints need to be considered. They need to work out which approach is going to be the approach that the team takes, not just the approach that you want to take. But there's also the idea of efficiency and working to strengths, where everyone has different strengths and capabilities. Not everyone has the same skills as you do. Some of them are going to be better at drawing, some better at writing, some better at taking notes, some better at following procedures, some better at keeping track of time. And the ideal team 
works to that diversity and difference. Now, this can be a really powerful aspect of teamwork that's very rarely taught, particularly in schools. But the idea is that we want to have um, teams formed based upon the skills of the team members so that we have the maximum skill set that complements one another rather than just a group of friends coming together, which often have the same skills, same interests, and don't have the diversity of ideas and opinions that would make a much more effective project team. There's also the idea that positive conflict is very healthy. Having people come up with different ideas, arguing their ideas, um, trying to have their idea accepted, but recognizing that it may not be, and that that's fine. If the team decides to go with another idea, either through convincing everyone or through having a vote and having a democratic process, then that's a good thing. It shouldn't just be seen as a negative that you've lost. You've made a contribution in terms of ideas, hasn't been accepted, but someone else's idea has been accepted. So now you get behind that idea and you work as a team to implement that idea. Okay, but that idea of team selection based upon project needs rather than social groupings is a really difficult thing for young kids, well, for anyone really, to um, come across. But it really does then focus on the project rather than the group, where we're trying to then meet the project goals rather than just the group goals of their interests and so forth. Um, and we see this quite often in when we have panels selecting students for sporting teams or for drama performances. And everyone accepts it's fine that you didn't get selected to be the lead in the drama performance because you didn't meet the characteristics and the skills of that particular character or that actor. Um, but we often don't see those same selection processes applied in other team activities. And we should. Okay, so collaboration can also involve um, seeking out assistance. Now, this is another area where we often have difficulties with as teachers. Of course, we tend to assess students on their individual contributions rather than on a team contribution. But there are ways of assessing the team's contributions. Yes, it does mean some students get marks for things that they didn't necessarily contribute themselves. But as long as they're all contributing different things, then the team can be assessed as a whole. Um, it also leads to the idea of drawing upon the experience and expertise of others. So it's not just on your own skill set that you can draw upon. And again, that comes down often to how we train students in our assessment models just to be assessed on what they do. But we can draw in the existence of other students, teachers, other teachers, um, other adults and experts. Now, often we have parents um, involving themselves and providing their expertise with various levels of transparency, but that can be implemented as part of the projects that students are doing. Indeed, we can incorporate students bringing in experts from beyond their own circle of interest. Um, now, for older students in high schools, we can even have them paying people to contribute part of what they're doing. We try to discourage payment, but <laughs> that idea of outsourcing and the idea of remixing the ideas of others and the outputs of others into our work is again a very challenging thing for many teachers. Now, one of the programming languages we're going to be using a fair bit is called Scratch. And its underlying premise is around remixing. You can take any other student's project, make a copy of it, and then it becomes your copy and you can then change it. And that's encouraged. And in the computing industry, that's how software is developed. No one develops it on their own. They take existing solutions and different ideas and they put them together and put them together in different ways, like we would remix a song and come up with new solutions. And that's an essential 21st century skill. And again, a difficult one for us to teach in our assessment oriented uh, perspective in education. Okay, so this brings us to the idea of moonshot thinking. Now, in moonshot thinking, 
we don't see problems as negatives. We see them as opportunities to do new things, to be innovative and entrepreneurial, and to do what's called solving for X. So we're going to now look at a little video clip. And that takes you into moonshot thinking. Oops, hopefully. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing. And it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas and then through science and technology bring them to reality and that then sets other people on fire that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero you know in thinking big and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had that he had that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon and here we are. These aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went. No one really knew how to build an airplane, right? No one knew how to fly an airplane. It was amazing and crazy and wonderful and they wanted to explore. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it? He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that. Or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. And one of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to be trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible, have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. Choose to go to the moon in this decay and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal to the great, big, and grand. And we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like really amazing poetic inspiration. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling in what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what, I think I can build a space on it, and most people do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people, we stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? So, moonshot thinking. This is the idea that we have X problems, which are the really big, huge problems that exist in the world. Now, we have to contextualize them for what students can engage with. But all of the big problems can be contextualized. There's plenty of examples and processes around doing that. But the idea of moonshot thinking is to explore these big problems. 
not simple ones. Then we have X solutions. This is proposing radical new ways to address these big problems. Not just the ways that have been tried before and failed and so forth, but trying to come up with new ways. And often this can be facilitated through X technologies. These are breakthrough new technologies that permit us with new ways of thinking about X problems and developing X solutions. So, some aspects of moonshot thinking. It's around trying to develop in scale. So, we, as students learn about doing moonshot thinking, initially it's going to be things that relate just to themselves. Um, how do I make a better bicycle so that I can get to school quicker? Um, or it may be about things for their family, how I might develop a better solution so that we can have our sandwiches made more quickly in the mornings for the whole family. Or it might be things for their friends. But over time, it then develops to include their classmates, and their neighbours, and their school community, then their local neighbourhood. Then eventually students start thinking about how things might impact upon their country. And then towards the end of, of primary school, they start thinking about how it might impact upon the world and the globe and environmental issues and things of that nature. Now, X problems also develop in scope from those affecting just on not just themselves or a few people, but how the solutions might be useful for everybody. We also have them develop in time frames. So uh, initially, students will be thinking about their immediate needs, what they're going to need for today or for tomorrow, or for next week. But over time, they'll develop their ability to think in wider time frames. What would this solution be like in terms of changing things for the class next year? Um, or in five years' time, how might things be different? And eventually, how might future generations benefit from their solutions? And then they also develop an ambition from making small incremental changes, which slowly improve things, to making really big revolutionary changes. And you can see entrepreneurs such as Elon Musk um, trying to make electric cars that drive themselves or to travel to the moon or to have personal robots. These are all things that are X thinking type um, ambitions. So it's really about making those 10, 100, 1,000 time better solutions. Often when we look at making things, making improvements, we look at how it might be made 10% better, 1% better. And sometimes that's the best we can do. But moonshot thinking is about really trying to make really big changes. Now, this, of course, involves risk. Many of these will fail. The, the whole process of taking um, challenges is that they do involve greater risk. And we need to re reward that risk rather than penalizing it. Now, we're really bad in schools at doing that. We, are we make students risk adverse. We make it so that they are afraid to take risks. Of course, it will impact upon their grades or how people perceive them, a whole range of factors. But we can change that and encourage moonshot thinking by re rewarding risk, by focusing on the process and not the solution or the product. Having students receive marks for coming up with a really challenging, um, ambitious outcome, even though they don't achieve it. So, this process of rewarding risk um, relates to um, an educator called Vygotsky, who came up with the concept of zone of proximal development, which suggests that most learning occurs when students attempt to do things beyond which they already know how to do. Now, it can't be too far that it's beyond what they're capable of doing, but it needs to be beyond what they've previously done. All learning occurs within the boundaries of what they can already do and what they can't do. There's a space between those that's called the zone of proximal development, which is what students can do, but which they haven't tried to do yet. And that's very much where moonshot thinking can fit within. So teachers should set high expectations and reward rather than penalize students doing likewise. And we can take many examples from industry, 
of those innovative approaches to um, attempting things and the successes that they've been able to achieve. Of course, we don't hear about all of the failures, but students should learn about those as well, just to understand that most successful entrepreneurs have failed a dozen times at least before they're successful. Um, Thomas Edison made the famous quote in coming up the light bulb that he'd, this was his, um, no, I forgot the quote, but it, he, he, he'd, try, he'd made a thousand mistakes before he'd been able to achieve his one success. People only remember that one success. They don't remember the, the thousand mistakes, but those thousand mistakes are necessary in order to achieve that success. Okay, so now let's look at another pedagogical approach called play-based learning. Now, this is commonly used in our youngest years, but I would argue it can be applied at any year level, even through to adults. We lose play-based learning as we focus on structured, formalized learning processes. But play-based learning is how we naturally learn throughout history. Before we had education systems, we learned through play. Um, even as adults, they played together. Sport was seen as a competitive play based substitute for model forms of combat, learning how to fight one another. We played sport. Um, it also helped us with our hunting and gathering and a whole range of other processes. But play has always been an essential part of learning. So there's a video clip from Dr. Peter Gray that helps explain the concept of play-based learning. But essentially, it's around some key fundamentals. The first is self-direction. The children should be allowed to choose what they play and how they play. You can supervise and suggest ideas, but the, the children, the students need to make the choices. They shouldn't be directed in what to do. That then starts becoming work and not play, even though from your perspective, it may seem like play. It needs to be unstructured exploration. They need to be able to explore themselves, select objects and activities based upon their own interests. And there needs to be lots of options in order for that then to be possible. If, if they're only given one option, then they don't really have much choice. So providing them with lots of options, lots of activities and tools and resources allows them to explore in a playful way. It needs to be fun. Once it starts becoming tedious and onerous, it ceases being play. They need to enjoy what they're doing. And it needs to be process oriented, not goal oriented, not focused on getting the correct result. Yes, sometimes we play competitive games and have more structures than others, but most of play is focused around the doing rather than the achieving. And again, quite different to how much of our formalized education has its focus. A few other elements. Um, should be self-chosen and self-directed, intrinsically motivated, focused again more on the means rather than the ends, guided by mental rules rather than strictly formalized rules, but students will make up their own rules. They'll be creative and come up with their own structures within a play-based activity, particularly when it's collaborative, um, so that things happen in a relatively rule-based way but it's their rules. And some of those rules may not make sense to an adult, sometimes not even to the children, but it provides them with a the framework and the creativity is in the coming up with the rules. That's where a lot of the learning is occurring. And it needs to be imaginative, um, not bound and not structured by adults. And essentially it needs to be in a non-stressed framework, relatively so. Can still be competitive and students still be can be um, actively engaged in trying to beat one another and so forth but it shouldn't be in an overly stressful way there shouldn't be adverse consequences as a result of not achieving whatever is in, involved in their games so there's a series of four video clips um, that will help you understand play-based learning in more detail in terms of the various aspects and i encourage you again to have a look at those so take another quick break and then we're going to come back and look at how we can integrate these various aspects of the technologies learning area to improve student learning. 
Okay, welcome back. And now let's look at the integration connections. So we have our curriculum. We've got a range of subjects. Um, design and technology and digital technologies make up the technologies learning area, but we've also got um, English and mathematics and science and history and the arts and all of the others. We also have the cross-curricular learning areas, which we're going to explore a little bit today, and the um, general capabilities of which digital literacy is one, creativity is another. So together, these support um, opportunities to integrate the various elements of what students are learning, um, coupled with another aspect around student diversity. In the curriculum, you will be provided with guidance around what's called related content. This is where the curriculum writers have seen some obvious relationships with other learning areas in particular, and how what they're learning in the technologies learning area can relate to other learning areas. And so they can be taught together or in ways that support one another. That doesn't necessarily mean they've covered everything, and you may see other possibilities in terms of how you contextualize the learning. But what's important, particularly in the primary years, is that we can achieve a lot of efficiency by teaching the same content that addresses a range of learning outcomes, content descriptors. Um, that means you've got more time to spend in student learning, particularly around project-based learning, and it allows students to see the interrelationships more. And in terms of cognitivism, it allows them to build neural connections between different concepts that they're learning, rather than have them um, develop in different parts of the brain without those connections. That, again, that's getting a little bit further into learning theory than we need to today. We also have our cross-curriculum priorities. Now, these are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia, and sustainability. Now, sustainability is a big one you'll see throughout, particularly design and technology, but there's also going to be opportunities to explore what they're learning around the design process or even digital technologies in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, and also around our neighbours in Asia and how different approaches are done around different concepts and techniques in those contexts. And these again broaden students' learning by focusing on these priority areas. Okay, we also need to plan for diversity. We've talked a little bit about differentiation, but we need to ensure that all of our students achieve success in their learning. And if we just do generic teaching, um, if you write your lesson plan up and come in and give your lesson plan and pretend that you've been successful in teaching, um, you won't have been. A good proportion of your students will not have achieved success because you haven't catered for their particular needs. And teachers are very guilty of this, particularly beginning teachers. And it's very difficult because you have to plan and develop up your lessons. And then you come in and you give your lessons. But until you know your students in detail and their strengths and weaknesses and so forth, you can't necessarily adapt what you're going to teach to the needs of your students. But it's something that good teachers certainly do develop. And it's certainly an, an important aspect of the curriculum. OK, so there's three main aspects of planning for diversity. There's around students that have disabilities. So some capacities that make, um, that provide them additional challenges. Gifted and talented students who have some capacity to um, do more than the average student, but are often not provided with the opportunity to do so. And then we also have English as an additional language and dialect students, students that have challenges because um, around understanding the language being used in teaching. OK, so the principles are that each student can learn and it, the students need to be given opportunities to learn, that they're entitled to that and they're entitled to achieve success. Now. What success means may be different for different students. That's part of diversity. But they are all entitled to achieve a level of success, not to be forgotten about, ignored, and their disadvantage um, exacerbated 
because of disinterest. We still need to set high expectations for all of our students across the range of diversities, but those expectations may be quite different for different students. Expectations for students who, have, um, who are gifted and talented could be quite different to a student that has a particular disability. And then we have what's called um, twice challenged students, where they might be gifted and talented and have a physical disability. Um, so you may need to have considerations and then potentially they could also have English as a, as a second language. So you need to understand your students and you need to come in your planning and your teaching, devise ways to achieve success for them. Now, this could very often be around their needs and interests. Um, now, in the ideal world, you would develop, have taken into account the diversity of all of your students, even those that don't fit within some of these formalized capacity, um, categories. Of course, every student has got different interests and different needs and capabilities. But we do sometimes have to group um, students together in order to cope with the complexities of teaching. But in an ideal world, every student would have an individual learning plan that you had devised around their particular strengths and weakness and interests and so forth. But we also have to consider the realities of a teaching environment. Okay, so that's been a look at pedagogy and the different approaches to teaching and learning as they relate to technologies education. There are lots of other pedagogical approaches and you'll explore those in some of your other um, subjects. And of course, when you get out into teaching, over time, you'll continue to explore new approaches. New ones are coming up, being developed all the time through the research process being conducted. And it's important that you keep up to date with what changes occur in teaching and learning. But for now, as a pre-service teacher, of course, you're going to be focused on um, just a few of these. But your learning about pedagogy is going to continue throughout your teaching career. So in tutorial this week, we're going to do two activities. The first is around the design cycle. And we're going to use paper planes and making a paper planes to learn about the design cycle. And here, the most important aspect is learning how to come up with a variety of designs how to test those designs and to see which ones work more efficiently, the fact that some will fail and some will be successful. It will take you a number of attempts to get a successful outcome. This is part of that process of failure and learning from failure and going through the design process and evaluating what's worked, what hasn't worked. And I also want you to think about moonshot thinking. If we were to apply that to paper planes, Having come up with your design for a paper plane that flies furthest distance, what if you were challenged to come up with a design for a paper plane that doesn't fly five meters, but flies five kilometers? Not asking you to do that, but how would it change the way you go about your designing? How would it change the way you think about solving that problem? There are ways it would be achievable. Um, think through that and in tutorial, have an opportunity to discuss that with your tutors about what could be done around a five kilometer flight paper plane. What could be involved in achieving that? Now, in on the course website, there are a couple of video clips and resources to assist you. Um, one resource provides a range of templates to give you some ideas about paper plane designs. You don't have to follow them. You can come up with your own, but explore different designs. Look at why some of them do different things, try to think through how they might change the effectiveness of your paper plane. So if we were doing this in a classroom environment, we'd be focused on these particular um, content descriptors, uh, producing and implementing by choosing various equipment and making things and building things and generating and designing, going through and iterating. Um, I think I've just repeated the same statement there, but <laughs> never mind. So on the course website, you'll find a range of video clips that also show you how paper planes have been used in schools, uh, particularly from a movie called Paper Planes, which recorded a paper plane competition 
um, by a student in Outback, New South Wales, and going to a competition, uh, international competition in Japan on paper planes. So just gives you, again, a little bit of stimulus um, and an anticipatory set. Um, some of those ideas to get a lesson started could be showing a clip from that particular movie. And I encourage you to have a look at the movie. It does go through the design process quite effectively. So your challenge is to create a paper plane that flies the furthest distance or flies the longest time. Two different outcomes um, and requires actually two quite different designs. Um, once you iterate at least three times and improve your design and to take photos or videos of your initial design and your final design and submit those to Microsoft Teams and Learning at Griffith before your tutorial. In your tutorial, I want you to recreate your designs and you'll show them with the support of your, your tutors and they'll take you through that. And if you're doing it at home, you'll, you can demonstrate your paper plane to your tutor online. But have a look at the different designs before the tutorial. See if you can come up with a really good design and then you'll demonstrate that in the tutorial. Particularly look at the fold and, fold and fly plane templates and just see what you can learn from the experts in paper plane design. And look at the video clips, paper planes and paper pilots. Now the other challenge is called the Vegemite challenge. It used to be called the peanut butter and jelly challenge, but so many students have got allergies to peanut butters now that we um, change it to Vegemite challenge. But essentially, students are looking at the concept of algorithms and debugging, which is working out what's gone wrong. And the focus of this challenge is around learning the importance of accurate instructions and how instructions can be misinterpreted. And so even though we can give an algorithm to someone to follow, um, they may interpret in different ways. And we have to ensure that our algorithm is clearly uh, communicated so that it achieves the result that we expect it to achieve. Now in this, for on-campus students, you're going to complete the challenge as directed by your tutor um, with other students in teams where one student will take the role of the instructor, the others will try to follow the instructions um, and you'll video or take photos of that process and share those onto Teams and Learning at Griffith to show evidence of having completed the activity. For students at home, you'll need to have some bread, some margarine, some, a spread, um, a, a knife, and something to try to minimize mess. And what I'd like you to do is with your family or friends, um, you're going to give them instructions. So you're going to come up with an algorithm for them to follow. Oh, sorry, they, they will come up with an algorithm for you to follow. So you give them the task of writing a set of instructions to make a sandwich that you're going to then follow. But the key aspect is you're going to follow it explicitly and you're going to purposely misinterpret their instructions where there's ambiguity. The idea is to highlight how instructions that seem really clear can be misinterpreted and done in different ways, often humorously different ways. And again, have your friends or you could take the, no, have them take photos or videos of you following their instructions and post those to um, Teams and Learning at Griffith. So to help you, there's a video clip or two video clips. Um, one where a teacher is demonstrating this activity and another is where a parent is demonstrating it to their children to give you an idea of the different misinterpretations that can come about um, in following the instructions. So that's what's involved this week in terms of the tutorials and I look forward to seeing what you're able to achieve in your posts to Learning at Griffith and to Teams. That's it for this week.